the Holy Gospel according to St. John, the third chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his deeds have been carried out in God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Believe and see the promise. God's word is certain. Not believing in yourself or your perspectives or your understanding of how things should go, but trusting, leaning, completely relying on Jesus every step of the way. They had been through a great deal as they found themselves wandering around Edom. They remember how a long time before that they had experienced the plagues around them and before that had experienced terrible distress and slavery at the hands of Pharaoh. And they cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them from their distress, as Reese reminded us earlier today. As such, God raised up one right out of the water, whose name was Moses. And Moses went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go. And Pharaoh said, no way, baby. And plague after plague came upon the people of Egypt, until eventually the blood of little baby boys began to pour out into the homes of the Egyptians. And Pharaoh said, go, take the wealth and riches, but just get out of here. And then Moses led the children of Israel, along with a mixed multitude, out of the land of Egypt, out of slavery. And then Pharaoh changed his mind. And the people of Israel found themselves between a rock and a hard place water before them, Pharaoh's army behind them. How could they believe and see the promise? God's word is certain. Well, there they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from all their, all their distress. God said to Moses, uh, speak softly to me, but carry your big stick and hold it right over this water. And as soon as Moses did, that water became as walls of water, and the children of Israel were able to go through that Red Sea on dry ground with their dry, ashy feet not getting wet. And once they had gotten to the other side, Pharaoh's army, in its perspicacity and in its perseverance, chased them. And they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. And once again, he delivered them from their distress. As God told Moses, see that staff? Now put it on down and watch what goes down with it. As the waters that were walls now came on top of Pharaoh and his armies, and as they tried desperately to escape but could not because no one can thwart the plan of God, the enemies were destroyed, 
and they never saw those Egyptians alive again. Believe and see the promise. God's word is certain. Gathering them by Mount Sinai and giving them the Ten Commandments to say, this is now how you will live. Believe and see the promise. God's word is certain. They eventually found themselves wandering around Edom in today's first reading. And what were their words? Words of prayer and supplication? Words of love and adoration? Absolutely not. There in the wilderness, there in the midst of what they thought was the end of the world, they complained and said, we have no food, we have no water, and we don't even like this worthless food. You brought us out of Egypt to die, Moses. Why, why, why? The children of Israel's questions are not all that uncommon as we find ourselves in our sin asking similar questions of our leaders and even of God. How can they have said they had no food when they then turn around and complain about the food that God had provided? Obvious, you can, you can see. They were the ones who were misled, but they did not cry out to the Lord. They instead went to Moses and said, Moses, we have an idea. You talk to God, and you tell God to get these snakes out of here. And that's not the way that God was going to do it. Because God's way of delivering and saving is not always the way our way of thinking works. God did not want to take those snakes away. God made the snakes. They're his snakes. He owns them. And if he wants them in the wilderness, by golly, he can have them in the wilderness. And that's exactly where they were. As a matter of theological fact, it would seem, ha! Huh, that, by God's mercy and grace, they weren't the only serpents in the wilderness that day. These complaining Israelites needed to be taught a lesson. And the lesson was this. God told Moses, get a stick. And on the stick, fashion a bronze serpent. And on that serpent, on that stick, put that serpent and lift it high. And any who look up at what I lift up shall live. It doesn't come in the way that they thought it should. But interestingly enough, anyone who looked at that bronze serpent that day was rescued from the pandemic. And they didn't have to wait three weeks for the next dose. They didn't have to deal with a day of insanity, suffering, and fatigue after dose number two. And it was even far more efficient than any J.J. could ever imagine. God, in his mercy and grace, saved his children again. He rescued those who would believe and see the promise that God's word is certain. And in believing and seeing that promise, they would look up to that which God lifts up. Don't think that the children of Israel learned this lesson forever. Sadly, the children of Israel forget very quickly. Perhaps we can blame it on a hybrid, remote, or in-person education. Take your pick. But whatever it is, they forgot just as quickly as they had been told. And they found themselves once again in the dark night of their own souls. That's where we meet Nick at night. Nicodemus comes to Jesus in today's gospel, and he is in the same wilderness of being perplexed and wondering about who Jesus actually is. When Jesus says, you must be born from above, Nicodemus answers, how can I crawl up inside of my mama once again? Oh, Nicodemus, please believe and see the promise. God's word is certain. To be born from above is to be born by water and the spirit and that means it doesn't come in the way that you imagine it should. It comes the way God's designed it, by his mercy and grace. And hence, in today's gospel, Jesus offers those memorable words that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, 
but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. You see, those who despise the light walk in the darkness, and their deeds show it. It shows when their faith is in themselves, and their faith is in their perspectives, and their faith is in their own ideas. Instead of focusing their faith to look up at what God lifts up. And what God lifts up is his perfect sinless son, Jesus the Christ, a human being born up on a large pole, held up in the wilderness of our wacky world, so that all who look up to him, all who lean upon him, all who trust in him, all who believe in him, will not die in the wilderness, hear me, church, but will have everlasting life. Only because God is the one who gives, and that's why our red-letter challenge word for the week is giving. God is the great giver of gifts. God's constantly giving, giving, giving. He's giving manna in the wilderness, water out of rocks, quail on the ground, and yet those gifts are often despised. And even he gives a bronze serpent on a stick and then provides his son on a cross, and sadly, the world still won't believe. But that's not where God positions us. We can be suckered into believing in ourselves and our own posterity, thinking that we understand how God can fix this mess, waiting, waiting, waiting for a stimulus check to be put in the mail for us as if that's going to solve our problems. No, my friends, your salvation is not going to come the way you think it should. It comes by looking up at the one God lifts up. And what God lifts up are the lowly, the despised, and the rejected. For we ourselves were dead in our trespasses and sins in which we once walked, following in the power of the prince of the air, the spirit at work in the sons of disobedience. But God, in his mercy and grace, has sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to meet us in the midst of our pandemic and to bring healing to our body, mind, heart, and soul, so that by his grace we may be saved through faith. And it's not of our own doing. All of it is a gift of God, not by our work so that none of us can boast. God calls the world to look up at what he lifts up, and what he lifts up might not always be predictable, to people around us. He lifts up a word of hope and life. He lifts up a promise and says, believe and see the promise. God's word is searching. He lifts up red letters that challenge us throughout the week. He lifts up waters so that we, like Moses, may be drawn from them as we're attached to Jesus' death and resurrection. He lifts up a chalice of salvation and a bread of life and the world says it's bread and wine, but we know it is Jesus' body and his blood. And all who look up to what God lifts up shall live. We are called to look up to what God lifts up in words of holy absolution and forgiveness. Church, God is calling us to look up to the means of grace, for that's what he lifts up. Not our own less than victorious vaccinations, not our own masquerade parties, not our own sanitizing devices, and certainly not our own governors or princes. God instead calls us to put our faith totally and completely and solely in Jesus the Christ. And as that happens by the power and grace of his spirit, those who are wounded in the wilderness, those who are hungry and thirsty get to thank the Lord for his steadfast love and his wondrous work to the children of men because he satisfies the longing soul and he fills the hungry with good things. And he's filling you today because he's calling you like Moses 
out of the water. He is calling you like David the psalmist to cry to the Lord in your trouble and know that he delivers us from our distress. He's calling you like Paul to believe that you are what God's made you, purchased in Christ Jesus to do good works in the world. And he is calling you like Nicodemus in the dark night of your soul to believe and know that whoever believes in Jesus will not perish, but have everlasting life. You, dear church, are being called to lift up things in the wilderness even today. And the world needs to look at what you are lifting up so that they may live as well. What does it mean? It means not joining in to the less than felicitous and God displeasing gossip. It means not giving in to the temptation of disbelief. It means not joining that mighty chorus of those who are always negative around us. It means instead to believe and see the promise that God's word is certain. And as that word is certain, my friends, we may speak softly, but we lift up and carry a very big stick. It is the cross of Jesus, that priceless grace, that amazing love that sets us free. For when I behold Jesus Christ, true God who died for me, I wonder much at his love as he hung on a tree. What kind of love is this? What kind of love is this? You showed your love, Jesus, there for me on Calvary. You had no sin, holy Lord, but you were tortured and tried, and on Golgotha, there for all my sins you bled and died. What kind of love is this? It's a love that gives. And it's the love that's been given to you, dear saints, to burst out of your purple into pink and rose today, even one hour earlier than you really, really wanted. And by God's mercy and grace, he's seen fit to wake you up, to meet you in your pain in the wilderness, and hear you cry out to the Lord in your trouble and know that he delivers you from your distress. Lift up what he tells you to lift up and look up to what he lifts up. And as you do, you will tell the world where your faith is truly founded in the one Christ Jesus who died and who rose and who's coming again in glory to free the earth from the bondage of slavery and death. He gives us a chance to do so as we lift up those who are afflicted around us, as we remember those who have been less than fortunate, as we especially remember women during Women's History Month and champion the way that God has used those whom others have rejected, who have accomplished great things in Jesus' name. Let us continue to look up to that which Jesus lifts up, and as we do, my friends, we shall not die, but we shall live, and we shall declare the wonderful works of the Lord. For God loved the world so that he gave his only Son of a lost to save, that all who would in him believe shall everlasting life receive. Believe and see the promise. God's word is certain. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.